and more activities uh, related to community and related to uh, uh, dealing with reality in the best possible manner because uh, these political and, and legal issues are somehow um, in, a, in a deadlock and will probably remain there for a certain time. Uh, cooperation with other organizations and media remains crucial in building the steady uh, local support uh, network, uh, especially what I can see from the reports uh, of, uh, for instance, Sarah Open Center is that media is getting better and better each year. The approach and the writings and, and uh, in general the uh, relation towards LGBT communities is improving. improving. Uh, but still confidence uh, in the state and also in EU report, the support uh, remains weak. Uh, the progress has been made in community building, cooperation with the media and police. Okay, and then what I said is that uh, further improvement in policies and public awareness will have little to do with the EU integration process because that process itself is, is uh, still in a deadlock. Uh, so improvement of life quality of LGBT persons in BIH, uh, we can say that it depends on intersectoral struggle regarding the combat against oppressive social and economic system. And this is something that uh, some authors uh, and activists uh, have addressed this issue recently that uh, so, uh, LGBT activism or movement should be more involved in uh, and cooperated with other uh, movements in, in Bosnia and with other mar marginalized and uh, oppressed uh, groups, and there are many of them. So uh, the position of LGBT uh, people will hardly improve uh, without improving uh, the position of everybody else and the, the, the improvement of the system itself. So about this cooperation, my colleague Leila will uh, continue. accepting me into the team fairly late in the process. Uh, she has done 99% uh, of the work and I'm uh, trying to sort of edge a little bit of the chapter into my direction uh, that has always been very much interested in the whole of co concept of interdisciplinarity, intersectionality and, and so on. Uh, and uh, one thing that uh, I wanted briefly to talk about is how uh, the, the parallel movements of different human rights groups uh, have persisted in Bosnia and Herzegovina and different groups. Women's uh, movement, uh, LGBT, IQ movement, disability movement, uh, movement for the rights of children, uh, in particular issues that were more uh, present immediately after the war in the late 90s, issues of interdis inter internally displaced persons, uh, <coughs> refugees who are returning. Uh, and then also what Wayan mentioned this morning, uh, the, the movement of workers' rights, so the whole class issue uh, is something that uh, is happening in a, in a parallel sense. So in a sense, if you look at uh, the NGOs that exist, for instance, among women's NGOs, <coughs> you will rarely find at the head of those NGOs women with disabilities, and very often a lot of these heads of women's NGOs will not be sensitized to LGBTIQ issues. And as uh, Leila mentioned in some uh, correspondence, for them it would be even difficult to pronounce lesbian and gay, but they would be so happy with this abbreviation that is now uh, used so that they can sort of distance themselves uh, from, from, from that. Uh, the, the problem in that is that there is an assumption that all of these movements are movements of homogenous groups, and these assumptions exist uh, not only uh, outside, but also within the groups themselves. Uh, so uh, also in the disability movement, there is a whole surprise if you ask them uh, about uh, lesbian, uh, lesbians with disabilities, gays with disabilities, uh, Roma with disabilities, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, this assumption that all discriminated groups are homogenous 
is also an assumption uh, that the donors, governments, policymakers seem to hold on to. Uh, and uh, what I would try to try to answer is to what extent uh, has that kept the government support until last year from uh, more active support to the uh, LGBTIQ movement in, in Bosnia. Uh, because, for instance, the EU has had a very uh, rich uh, program and very good funding uh, for the democratization of human rights since 1998. But no LGBTIQ groups or events have, have ever been uh, supported to with that program. So really to respond to, to, the, to the question uh, whether the existing EU policies in Bosnia towards supporting the civil society, are there widening the existing gaps between these movements even further? Uh, by not recognizing, by not being able to sort of identify these cross-cutting issues in their human rights, in their human rights program. Uh, and uh, also are they all creating additional competition between these movements, in particular now that funds are, are, are running, running low in, in, in Bosnia. And for the end, just one uh, anecdote uh, uh, from t September 2008 when we had the first uh, public uh, Q event, uh, the Q association that Adam mentioned was holding the, its first festival. Uh, it was not a parade, it was not a pride parade or a tolerance parade, but it was a festival where there was a very nice uh, sort of media material prepared <coughs> and artistic exhibition. Uh, and I wanted to go there with a friend of mine who is a lesbian with a disability. She is a wheelchair user. She never came out uh, publicly. But then I discovered that the event was taking place at the Academy of Art, which is not accessible, so she did not go. But then a mutual friend of ours who is blind, he came with us. So he's, uh, he's heterosexual. And uh, at one point I felt it was too hot inside. There were so many people at that exhibition. It was magnificent to see so many different people supporting it. So I decided to come out. And for some of you that know, when we were faced with these uh, Wahhabi and the radical Islamic uh, group that were out to, to beat people, they were filming. And as we came out, they were shocked. They suddenly dropped the camera and moved back because they were not expecting a heterosexual couple. <laughs> uh, and then in particular, when they saw the white stick of this friend of mine, they said, oh, but he's blind, you know, like, he can't be gay because he's blind. <laughs> a little anecdote at the end. Yeah. Because um, just I think the reluctance of, of the media and, and many politicians 
you guys deal with it, with feminist issues, to get out of that kind of heteronormative, um, very conservative um, picture where they're not even thinking about um, non-heterosexual anything, right? It's, it's enough of a challenge for someone to, to, to just go beyond that sort of um, paradigm. So I think putting that into, into context will help um, understand some of the limitations on um, you know, what kind of strategies LGBT activists can even adopt. Um, another thing would be to, you seem to take for, for granted the idea that um, Europeanization or um, EU accession is going to um, improve things. Right? Um, and if you talk to people in Croatia or Slovenia, right, um, it's not necessarily, or Hungary, um, a, um, you know, something that, that's going to make everything better all of, all of a sudden. Obviously, there are tools there that, um, and especially before accession, there are, there are tools that activists can use to put political pressure on um, politicians and um, government structures. Um, why do you know more about this than, um, than I do? Um, but just to, to avoid the kind of, or, or to, to be aware of the kind of you know, reification of the, oh, it's, everything's great in the West, and um, as soon as the EU comes in, you know, we get it. Because as, as you're pointing out, just having the laws there and the legal structure is not really changing that much, because if they're not being implemented, they're not being uh, respected, people don't have trust in the, in the legal system, and those are all really good points that you, that you have in there. Um, but then to connect it as, you know, well, what kind of effective strategy is this going to be if, um, they're already, these laws are in place and they're not really um, helping very much. So, um, I also wanted to know how you, you seem to distinguish between politics, and dealing with politics and working communities, which you said was not politics. Um, so I wonder if you could complicate, it, complicate that a little bit, because um, I would venture to say that all of this work is political in a way, right? But it might be, um, you might be going back to the terminology that the activists are using, um, which brings me really to my main question is, what do the activists say, right? You, you, you say you, you did all these interviews with activists, yes. right? So, and, and you're, you want to talk about their strategies, but I, I felt I was missing more of a sense of, okay, what kind of choices are they making? Where do they see dilemmas, right? wow. Where are they making strategic choices to say, all right, we're going to focus on Europeanization because that's the sort of dominant thing, and we're going to use it as a tool somehow, even though we might be personally critical of what it might bring us, or that it's a kind of be all end all model for us, right? So that's sort of what I was more interested in, in seeing, like what kind of choices are they being made, being forced to make, and then um, also what kind of, of disagreements and tensions are, are there among activists, because I, I know about a, a little bit of it, um, but then what, what are the implications of the different kinds of approaches that different groups are now taking? Because, you know, do you work with the system? Do you completely um, try to avoid it? Um, some of them are uh, working with the system and some of them are... Uh, exactly, but, but to give a sense of, all right, yeah. Not just that that's happening, and you know, because there's no sense in saying, "Oh, look, there's this movement; it's divided against each other." You know, and give people um, the ammunition to just dismiss it. But to say that these are the issues that people are grappling with; these are the choices that they're making, or <coughs> these are the, the, the ideas that um, that become relevant for them, um, given the context they're working in, um, and then we could really understand a lot more where where they're being situated. In. And what, um, what they're working on. Yes, by politics, I meant uh, by um, I meant advocacy towards the state to change uh, the policies. Uh, of course, I didn't mean that politics <coughs> is, doesn't include any uh, working with community or public or whatever. Yeah. But some organizations, uh, basically, there's only one in Bosnia which is. Uh, uh, which has this aim to uh, change uh, the system, to work with the system, to uh, change goals and to implement goals uh, and to educate uh, uh, public officials. Uh, other organizations are more involved in working with the community itself. Uh, why uh, do they 
avoid working with the state, uh, perhaps uh, they don't have this kind of ambition, or uh, they just have some of their uh, own reasons why uh, they uh, choose this. But exactly, so that means they maybe they have a different um, different approach, a different ideological stance, and you know they have different priorities. But um, it seems like the difference there is it's not it's between you know it's, it's a difference in strategy, not whether one's political or not, one's politics. I mean, I'm thinking about what what the political means in terms of you know in, in the kind of ways that people use it. But um, so, so I thought of it, and it doesn't. It's not always the same for me. Yes, it's about, uh, you said the choices is, is a very good uh, word in, in, uh, in the context of Bosnia because it's a, um, it is, a, it is a, a choice of the organization or of the individuals what kind of activism we want and what kind of activism will we implement. And uh, if we compare Bosnia <coughs> with Montenegro, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, or any other uh, country that received uh, candidate uh, status and started uh, EU accession, they use this as a tool, of course. We don't say that this EU integration will change uh, things uh, for the best, but they use it as a tool for um, advocacy towards uh, the legal uh, framework. And so in Bosnia, uh, there is no possibility to do that because uh, the country is still uh, in this deadlock. So there is a big, uh, it is a big decision on activists how to do that without uh, EU pressure, how to change uh, the system and the policies and the legal framework without uh, uh, progress reports and without uh, EU accession. And so uh, what I see, this is a really huge uh, um, task uh, where uh, one but where they must be really careful and really clever to outsmart the, the system in a way. So what they do is, for example, for instance, uh, educating uh, police officers from Canton Sarajevo. Now they have uh, much better uh, cooperation with police uh, officers only to do what? To uh, organize the basic uh, uh, police protection on the public uh, event. This is not something that NGO should do. Uh, so this is the uh, the job that a state should uh, be doing by its definition. Right, but it's not doing it. I mean, but this is a this is a, a, a kind of model taken directly from feminist or women's activism um, uh, the police. And she was working on uh, violence in, in Bosnia, so working with the police and the courts. And, uh, so it's, it's um, one other thing that I would just say though that is that the EU is not the only structure that. And that's what, so even if there's this deadlock, there are other donors you talked about or other ways to kind of get resources or, or put pressure on donors, but also, um, are you only talking about the NGO form? Because that's another issue is, you know, that's another sort of set of choices of, you know, a professionalized NGO, or do you um, organize activism in some other ways? Um, of course, there are you know, issues of money, very quick comment, just uh, uh, one thing. Uh, somehow it's happened to me that I'm familiar with the situation in Bosnia. And uh, the more I'm familiar, the more, uh, the more information I get, the more, uh, the more I can compare it to the situation in Montenegro a few years ago. And currently, I, I think that uh, everything what NGOs are doing is so similar to things that we were doing in uh, 2009 and 10 and 11, and I think that uh, there is a potential to do good and great things in Bosnia, and especially because there is some community there now when NGOs are, are trying to, to establish a cooperation with the state. And at the beginning of the process in Montenegro, we didn't have community, so there is a huge potential for, for future actions. But the country system is something that is not helping. And which is really good that you point out that you know these are the constraints and the and the you know the, the dysfunctional state is a major major problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, we agree on that. But I will uh, uh, charmingly disagree with my charming friend. <laughs> Um, uh, I have been many times uh, working uh, 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 in groups 
uh, involved in external and lesbian uh, workshops and experience. And for me, uh, the most, uh, how to say, the biggest impression I have is that, uh, first of all, that's a country where the worst war happened in, in, the, in Yugoslavia. Uh, we are post, post These are issues. And that's a very, uh, it's so present in every uh, story of every person, person, but also lesbian and gays. Uh, I was more, uh, we were more with lesbian groups and within the last you know, maybe seven or eight years. So what, uh, what is, um, what is uh, for example, very characteristic is that, and different than, than in, uh, uh, in Montenegro or Serbia, is that because there was a war and because the parents of the young lesbians now, because they're young, they're now, <coughs> they're, they're really children of the, of, the people, of the people who were in war, they feel very guilty uh, that their parents had a very hard time in the war time, they suffered or did they had to go to school, they were expelled, some of them had to do it. And that ends up to their difficulty to come out. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you, it's very difficult. Because you, even though you don't like your parents and their different generation, and all we know about generation, yeah, but still, you know, they feel this, you know, oh, they had a hard time. And now, on top of all that shit they had to go through, I have, they have to hear that their children are, you know, are gay and lesbians, and it's really what you want to say. <laughs> Uh, invited me to talk with me 
and until she told me, uh, uh, and she supported me, and she told me, you cannot be parent of your parents. Mm -hmm. So what I what I want to say is that it is really important to work with LGBT people and to encourage them and to explain them that they are not guilty. Yeah. So that's that's a uh, uh, really important part of work that all we have to do. But it's because a challenge. That, that is but, the problem. Yeah, and it, but it's but what you're raising, I think, is a challenge yeah. of you know contextualizing all of this and not using. So that, I mean, yeah. in all I mean, of these projects, right? Yeah. It's very complicated. There are lots of different. Um, because lesbians and gays in, in all these countries, they don't think about you. About you all the time, and you know they don't. <laughs> 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 no, but the point here, not saying they are doing this. Oh, okay. In relation to what Aleka was saying, and uh, the reason I did not really uh, touch upon it in the presentation, but I find it, uh, you know, one of maybe most interesting aspects of the paper that can be um, explored further. This idea how LGBT people or lesbians are engaged maybe in this sense, you know, use this as something that would, uh, you know, go counter to this ethnic insistence, you know, in such an ethnocratic state, you know. So we are we are gays and lesbians, and that might matter to us more than being Serb, Croat, or you know, Bosnia. Yeah. yeah. But but that's an interesting question. But yeah. Because I mean, is, I'm is thinking, it really? I mean, there's yeah, some yeah, space no. for. No, I'm thinking about my colleague here, um, who does work on um, LGBT activism in Hungary, and he's written about how the activists here have sort of positioned themselves between, you know. Uh, a European international identity, you know, where they, they get accused of not being part of the nation, they're not authentically Hungarian and everything. And so they are insisting on, I'm Hungarian and gay right. and lesbian, okay. right? You know. But in Bosnia, how do you do that? Bosnia and gay, right? that's the most Bosnian, right, right, right. right. But, but it, it, it just becomes more complicated. So mm -hmm. it's another part of this. It's an interesting thing to, to think about. Um, uh, I have a question basically about um, this um, stake because I still don't get like um, this discrepancy which you make between politics and uh, advocacy. I'm not really sure and especially if you talk about um, the communities and LGBT activism <coughs> and that, like uh, what Elisa also said like about being political or not being political like uh, how can community building not be political, like um, especially because what Labour was also saying that um, every organization, every community also has values. And many of the um, values which many communities have um, are also political, especially those ones, and I come from Bosnia and I know many organizations, um, and many community-based organizations. Like, so this is actually a very interesting question, like, um, what are you more interested in and how um, and are you planning actually to sort of like investigate within your um, narrative this narrative of the political and um, especially the potential of overcoming what Brian also said the ethnical tensions in the last three four or five years at least where um, due to the reason that like more and more LGBT organizations are functioning and new communities are opening, coming out, um, the visibility is being raised, like uh, how do you see the um, LGBT communities uh, interacting with each other beyond the national, the ethnic and the religious? Mm -hmm. Because um, I think that the LGBT communities in Bosnia have a huge potential actually to grow and to show how a, a contrast between this national versus uh, and ethnic versus like more unity based and um, community based like narratives. Yeah. 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 Just one short question. I'm really interested because we have a problem with our Lesbian and Gays initiative to connect with the, um, we have society of handicap of people with disability, they are in the same building and coming to our events and to our prides, but they are very close up. So I will have a question for you. What are the most successful tools to sensibilize LGBT for disability issues? And what are the most uh, cool tools to sensibilize uh, the disability movement people for LGBT? Yeah. 
what in, for the, in your experience? Because you've done that in <laughs> Yes, I've done
get the null at least six times. I stopped counting after six. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. But, but, but the title has plus the empathy and I think they're using... Yeah, if, if someone wants to shrink, I just propose that they shrink both to one yeah. time. Most of the other time is... The eternal problem. Thank you. Deserving of that violence. 
My attempt here is then to apply these concepts to the ways in which the Europeanization debate pits Muslims and queers in Kosovo against each other, producing Muslims as violent homophobes and rendering intersectional and cross-sectional subjectivities such as queer and Muslim impossible. My paper then examines homonationalist and pinkwashing assemblages in Kosovo in the process of European expansion. Through a reading of the homophobic attacks at the Night of Sex, a promotional event for the issuing of the sex magazine put together by the organization Kosovo 2.0 in 2012, I look at how queer rights discourses become a disciplining tool with which Muslim communities are policed in the name of LGBT rights and European futurists. There are two main points I want to make in this presentation by looking at the attacks on Kosovo 2.0. In the first part, I will trace how queers in Kosovo are produced as victims under siege by extremist Muslims, arguing that the attempt of the EU to save queers in Kosovo is a self-referential mission to save itself, both from this homophobic past and present, while maintaining the binaries of secularism versus Islam that allow the EU to stand for progress and modernity while producing Muslims as a threat to Europe and secularism. Here, I seek to bring to light the ways in which Muslims in Kosovo are produced as a threat to queers and therefore a threat to European integrations and orientations. In the second part, I will talk about the ways in which queer rights discourses become the cordon sanitaire that seeks to divide good Muslims, good local Muslims, from bad foreign Muslims coming from the Middle East. In the language of the queer activists after the attacks, those Muslims who organized the attacks were not representative of local, secular, tolerant Islam, but representative of a radical, violent Islam coming from further east. I argue that the tacit reading of local Islam as tolerant, secular, and European seek to other and externalize those Muslims who resist EU LGBT liberatory frameworks as extremists, particularly foreign Wahhabi types who have nothing to do with local Islam. Before I go on, I want to briefly address the difficulty of establishing the link between European Union expansionist politics and Islamophobia in the context of EU's selective protection of certain queer political formations, particularly as the EU claims to be Islam blind in much the same way that the US claims to be colorblind. While the EU expansion claims not to see religion, it does so at the expense of silencing Muslims, while positioning its secular and Christian values on Muslim-majority countries as the invisible universal norm, against which particular Muslim values are constructed. This unproblematic positioning of the EU as the invisible norm allows for an assimilation of discourse that renders those Muslims who resist the EU expansion along with its sectional politics as problematic, threatening, Wahhabis, suspects, extremists, etc. What I want to complicate here is the understanding that secularism is a universal, neutral norm and not a byproduct of Christian teleology of rights, governance, and temporality. In other words, I want to destabilize the now hegemonic idea that the EU expansionist project in the Balkan countries as in the Balkans as neutral to religion is used as a leveling tool that seeks to group together all Balkan countries as a post-conflict and post-socialist temporalities. In part, this has to do with the ways in which the Balkans have been rooted in Todorovic conceptualizations of the Balkans as an in-between space, not fully colonized and othered, not fully European either. This approach, while problematizing the Orientalist gaze with which the Balkans have been produced in Euro-American imaginations, fails to acknowledge that unlike non-Muslim populations in the Balkans, Muslims have been subjected to direct colonial rule in the past and the present. As such, Muslims in the Balkans cannot be conceptualized in the in-between space and grouped together with Balkan others, as at times it has been Balkan neighbors who have been the colonizers. Thus, the othering of Muslims in the Balkans is not just indirect, textual, and discursive, but direct and colonial, not only guided by Orientalist productions of semi-other, but Muslim other. As Talal Assad reminds us, the very absence of terms such as secular Catholic or secular Orthodox in the region and in Europe in general suggests that Muslims remain Muslims to the European project even when they are secularized. 
The concern for secularism and progressive values then in Europe is not so much guided by concern over the division between religion and politics, but rather the depolarization of Muslims in Europe and the periphery. The employment of sexual liberatory progressive politics in defense of secularism serves the purpose of framing the debate as secularism being under threat by religious extremists, read Muslims. The attacks on Kosovo 2.0, which I will be looking at in a moment, are not the only ones that illustrate this dynamic. They stand out as the most significant because of their overexposure and colonization of Islamophobia in the service of what Harita Ward has already observed in most of Europe, protecting injured homosexuals from Muslim homophobes. On December 14, 2012, a group of about 100 protesters attacked the launching of the media outlet Kosovo 2.0 magazine issue on sex, shouting out with faggots, they have no place here and God is great. Explanations for the attack in the media and official declarations were primarily focused on now typical Islamophobic language, characterizing Islam as patriarchal, backwards, and religious fundamentalists, framing the attacks around queer rights and secular religious divide. One Kosovo reporter wrote, quote, Taliban Albanians are a disease in our society. If left untreated you, and you intervene late, just like cancer, it's unlikely they will be cured for it. Such militants aim to slaughter reason, end quote. In another piece titled The Enemy Within Kosovo's Long Crusaders, the author argues, quote, the war is over and a new one has begun. This is a war of values and it will determine the shape our country takes. The freedoms that we have, the ones that we have fought for, can only be blown away unless we draw a line that cannot be crossed." End quote. As the Islamophobic big language that circulates within the EU is appropriated to discipline local Muslims by creating a line that can't be crossed, the symbolic line not only segregates queers from other marginalized groups in Kosovo, but seeks to move Kosovo from its in-between space fully within the boundaries of Europe. By locating the threat of extremist Islam outside the Islamic traditions of Kosovo, Kosovo is free from being perceived as the internal other within the EU. Islam that becomes the marker that Kosovo needs to remove in order for it to recover as a European nation free from its Islamic past. The protection and promotion of queer rights serves as an appropriate tool then to contain and eliminate the new enemy as necessary measure if Kosovo wants to fully integrate into the EU. Following the attacks, the EU financed a public relation campaign, launching a video called Stigma, where one of the most noted Kosovo journalists, Sieta Chara, hoped that Kosovo, quote, will reach a stage of European civilization when it won't be homosexuals who hide themselves from public, but those who use hate speech and attack them, end quote. European civilization here, equated with sexual rights and read as the final goal of the post-socialist and post-conflict transition provides a desired future destination that produces the illusion of Europe as a space free of hate speech and violence. EU financed projects of visibility of violence directed at the queer communities, on the other hand, conjure Kosovo as being plagued by violence and in need of assistance by the EU. This further serves the purpose of justifying EU involvement into the internal affairs of Kosovo. The involvement of the EU LEX mission in Kosovo in the local judicial processes in prosecuting the attacks is one such example, despite the fact that the EU LEX mission, its mandate is constricted to war crimes and corruption. The process of selective defense of the queer community over others not only prevents queer communities from building alliances with other marginalized communities, but also demarcates them as more valuable and worthy of EU protection. Pursuing the attacks on Kosovo 2.0, EULEX mission in Kosovo state prosecutor charged three people for inciting hatred. The charges of slight bodily injuries were acquitted due to a lack of evidence, yet the visibility of the EULEX involvement established the queer community along with Kosovo 2.0 as vulnerable victims of homophobic Muslims. The projection of the queer community as vulnerable victims allows for further EU neo-colonial intervention in Kosovo rooted in the now very typical heteronormative familiar care scenario where the child is in need of paternal care before it can gain full political agency and subjectivity. This teleological process of Europeanization where the EU comes to represent and protect the queer as the victim of violence sustains then the cycle of debt where queers are invited to promote EU integration at the price of disciplining those subjects 
who could endanger this process. How hegemonic powers employ vulnerable sexualized bodies to facilitate neocolonialism at the expense of some other is now well established. The choice to single out and co-opt women in queer rights narratives in the process allows for a moral essentialism which then legitimizes EU colonial presence in Kosovo along with its violence. The second feature of the post-attack discourse locates Muslim extremists in the registry of foreign Wahhabi who, unlike local secularized Kosovar Muslims, have infiltrated good Muslims with fundamentalist ideologies. Addressing the attacks, for instance, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Kosovo, Patrice Limit, compared the attacks with